Next, I'd like to welcome Gerhard Klimek. Dr. Klimek has helped to grow nanohub.org from 500 to over 2 million users annually. The suite of nanoelectronic modeling tools, NEMO, built his research groups at Texas Instruments, NASA, JPL, and now Purdue, simulates electron flow in atomistically small nanoelectronic devices. NEMO 5 scales to over 200,000 cores, served over 56,000 NanoHub users in nine apps, and helped Intel design transistors since 2015. Dr. Klimek is a fellow of IEEE, APS, IOP, AAAS, and the Humboldt Foundation. Today, he'll be talking about advanced computing and science gateways, demonstrating new paradigms in research, education, and publishing. Welcome, Gerhardt. Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess let me let me hook up myself here. Um, no, it looks good. Let me just plug myself in. Turn myself on. <clears throat> can you guys? Can you hear me? Okay. Good. Somehow, I need to get um, on that screen. All right, great. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, what I'd like to talk about is uh, NanoHub and knowledge transfer, how to get information from one group of people to another group of people. And, um, okay, let's see if that, okay, good. Hopefully I get this to work. Good. So, all right. So, I want to talk about not, uh, scientific knowledge transfer and really what uh, we've been told we couldn't do. All the things people think you can't do, and we felt we, we should be doing. And uh, so, this is an animated map, as you saw it fly by, and this is a, a static map of NanoHub users. Uh, that we had throughout, say, one year. So basically, people are interested globally in nanotechnology and learning about semiconductor devices, et cetera. So what I'd like to show is how we busted some of these myths and really connect research to education, how we're collaborative, and how we have global impact. And uh, I want to document that with real data. It's not a hyperbole, but I would demonstrate that that's the essence of a research university, of what we should be doing at Purdue. So, of course, I have to start out by giving thanks to my group, that my research group I have here is a, re a representative picture, and also the NanoHub and Hub Zero team that are really running the site. And, um, of course, NanoHub wouldn't be anything if we didn't have contributors that actually put content into the site. So that's also obviously critical. So when I take you into the future of computing, maybe I'm going to start uh, with a history. The year 1965 is actually incredibly important. Number one, I was born. Number two, somebody sketched something into his notebook. And that is this. That is a sketch in a notebook that describes how you can increase the number of components per integrated circuit and lower the price. It is actually an economic law. It is not a technology law, per se. It's an economic law. And of course, that is uh, associated with Gordon Moore, who is a co-founder of Intel. 
and we call it Moore's Law. Now, in many ways, we often look at Moore's Law in this form. And what we look at is the number of uh, uh, transistors on a given chip is increasing on an exponential scale. So we are now, actually, at, you just heard the talk, over 20 billion transistors on a chip. That is roughly three times as many people on the world working together without having a war. That is how large that number is, and that is how hard that engineering feed actually is. There's another aspect to Moore's law. Things are getting smaller. So I love to show this really ancient chart from 2004, but it kind of shows the trajectory of getting smaller and how people have been thinking about making devices smaller. And there's two aspects on how to make this. Number one, you've got to integrate a lot of things onto a, a circuit, and that means you have to do circuit design and system design. And then you also have to basically have cooking recipes that make these transistors and they make, them, uh, make these devices happen. So that is typically done in, in two pieces of software, at least uh, those are the grandparents of the today's software, that is uh, called Stanford Supreme and Berkeley Spice. Now, the name gives it away where it came from, but if you're not an electrical engineer or a process engineer, you prob probably don't know much of the background. So let me talk a little bit where they came from and how they were generated. So they were, came from circuit simulation out of a class project for a master's student, where they did a, a, a software that models circuits. Eventually, that software became open source, and it made its way around. Students took it along to industry. They took it to national labs. They took it to academia. And that became the standard of modeling circuits today. There were other pieces of software people, where professors held on tightly and didn't release it, and they didn't go very far. So this was one way. One of the first open source softwares, really, that became public. And uh, similar to process simulation, Supreme came out of Stanford, a group effort. They uh, was a community effort. And they basically built software for the benefit of a large community. Now, we think of this process engineering then like this. There's chips. There's people in bunny suits. But this was really a birth of an industry that came out of technical developments at, a, at universities. And Intel capitalization is over 100 billion today. The total industry is about 520 billion. Those are the numbers I looked up uh, yesterday or so. So what do we have next? So we have a lot of research going on in universities. And can we uh, put these structures together in different fields? And can we then make it impact the real world? That is what we want to do. We want to impact with research areas of nano and semiconductors. So how do you do that? Well, you think of the semiconductors and, um, as chips and people in bunny suits. You maybe think of fancy uh, facilities like what we have here at Purdue, where this is the Berg Nanotechnology Center. And um, what you maybe don't think so much about is some models that are underlying. So here's a visualization of some carbon nanotubes, or here's a visualization of quantum dots that are artificial atoms. You can really make artificial atoms with artificial absorption coefficients. And those are projects I'm teaching in my class now to design an infrared detector, for example, in this tool set. Um, maybe you also think of, of nanowires that are actually now so small that you that you sense the interface roughness on these wires, and they're very small. So all of that, uh, these are models that run on computers. And you're probably also aware that there are worlds in between um, the, um, well, we run them, computational scientists run them, and then you're aware that there are typically walls in between, right? There's experimental work and there's the theoretical work that is often bridged by artificial or, or real walls of understanding. And if we really want to have impact, one way to do that is actually break down these walls. If we want experimentalists to use our tools that we, we generate, we really have to make them available. And that means we first have to put them someplace on the web to actually share them and make them useful. And then maybe it has to be many of us that actually do this, not just a few. And then maybe more people come. Maybe then experimentalists come when you actually make it available. And if you're lucky still, you might be able to use it for teaching. And maybe then, you're, if you're further lucky, industry comes and uses it as well. 
So you have to break down these barriers, and it all is central to uh, breaking down barriers. And this is, in a way, a common dream. Many science gateways want to do this, right? This is not anything brand new, per se. Portals have been around for quite a while. But the key element, this is a common dream, but it's actually very hard to do. So I want to get to why is this hard to do and what, what's special about this. So really, the issue is that we don't do this. In general, we, don't, we write codes one person for one person. They get their PhD, and they're done. And there's no sense of ever using this later. There's no sense of actually transferring that to somebody else. So the essence is we really have to uh, be different in that sense that these are typical input texts that you might see. I, I consider this reasonably structured, but to you it's gibberish. And how can you turn that into something that looks like this, that might be actually a useful input, uh, user interface to a quantum.lab that actually runs this tool under the hood? So, so really you have to find ways to make interfaces to become user-friendly, and then you have to find ways to deliver those without any installation, without any demand on the user to be a computational expert or a person that runs, knows how to run in the cloud, et cetera. So that being said, we have to be user-friendly. We have to be accessible. But not, last but not least, we also have to be developer-friendly. Who are the people that can ultimately then put this material into the hub? That has to be friendly as well. So all of this is kind of hard to do. And then some myths emerged of why this is actually impossible. People think that you cannot write research codes or use research codes in education. My peer reviewer said you can't do that. They also said you must write your own code to do any good research, because that was the realm in nanotechnology. You write your own codes. You can't use somebody else's work. And experimentalists, of course, will never touch this. People really thought they, it will never happen. On the accessibility side, we were told you can't really run a cloud facility like this. This was before the word cloud was even a word, that we would actually serve the whole world to do this. And it wasn't possible at the time. And uh, on the developer side, people thought interfaces building is too hard, too difficult. That's not my specialty. I don't know how to do it. And by the way, I was told my own Nemo code, I should have rewrite my own code in Java in order to put it on the web. I had 200,000 lines of C++ and C code. I'm not going to rewrite that in Java to put it on the web. You've got to be out of your mind. That is the mindset existed. And there was no incentive to even share the codes. Why should I share my code? I write my papers myself. Thank you very much. So what's the incentive to actually do that? All right. So. Another way of looking at this is you can look at this as customers, you can look at this as suppliers, and you can look at this as a market. And that is what NanoHub in, in many ways has become, even though there's no money being exchanged. So let me look at the developer-friendly side and what, what we've done. And these are old slides, but I really want to drive home this point that we have to break down these barriers also for the developers. So a typical gateway proposal looks like this. It reads like this, I have a, a cool code. I want to put it on the web. I'm going to hire a web developer that speaks a different language, and I have to port my code over to make it run in the web. <laughs> and what happens is the proposal says, I'm going to need uh, about $500,000 to put this code over. There's a lot of uh, transfer of knowledge from the researcher to the web developer. They don't even speak the same language. There's a lot of demand on the researcher. And what happens, it takes forever, and the researcher marches forward. Their code is evolving. It's not staying the same for three years or two years. So the point is, this researcher gets really upset because no new research is getting done. And what shows up on the web up here has nothing to do with their latest version of their own research code. So there's a complete decouple. And I can tell you that if you wanted to put up 175 tools on, on, on a site and you uh, required a half a million dollars, I don't know where I would find $88 million to put codes up into a gateway. It will not happen. Nobody will finance that. But that's the problem, that this is the standard process that was in many, many proposals. And what happens then is the, the user side have a, a bad reputation developing because they think there's no real research codes. These are toy application. No deep research is doable because it's not keeping up with what the researcher does. And maybe, if you're lucky, you can use it for education. 
So NanoHub is different. We actually did deploy some 175 tools in, in a few years without $88 million. No rewrite, no middleman. We basically cut out this middleman and let the researcher herself, himself, put up their own codes into the web and have it evolve. And we have an ecosystem that does it. And I want to demonstrate with numbers that this actually works. So here is the number of uh, uh, active developers in green and the number of new tools at a given time. And then new versions show up and indeed people update their own codes. So that you can think of this now as new versions of tools. You can also think of this as um, um, suppliers, products, and product innovation. The products keep getting better in the site. It's not a decoupled thing. So that's kind of beautiful. And now the next question is, how do people work together? So here, I'm, I'm an electrical engineer showing social network charts, right? So where are we going? So the, the point is, these dots are now individual persons working at an institution, and the lines in between are their collaborations. Those are the tools they work together with in SVN, CVS, or, or Git. So what you see here is there's a network of people uh, that are working together, and we can shout out who's contributing to the, uh, to the site. And what I wanted to know is how important are these network connections in terms of impact? I wanted to measure if you have a lot of collaborations, would you impact more users? So, so here's a chart. This is on a linear scale. I measure for uh, the number of collaborators people have versus the number of users each individual person serves. And obviously, this goes up um, uh, nonlinear. So in fact, it goes up strongly. So you have to put it on a log-log scale. So what I'm showing you here is actually median data, meaning uh, people here that have uh, 10 collaborations say, this is the median data of my distribution. And what it really says is, the more you collaborate, the more impact you have. It's pretty simple, right? Now, but what's really interesting is if you put all the people that I had shown on the social network chart on this chart as well, I can show them, show you that, wow, look at this. The distribution up here is pretty narrow. The distribution down here is pretty wide. And what does that mean? It means that if you're working down here, whether or not you're going to be successful and serve a lot of people, it's pretty scattered. It's hard to predict whether you're going to be successful. You might have a glorious application that serves 1,000 users, but you're just as likely to serve 10 users. But if you're working in a large collaboration network, it seems like you can have somewhat predictive success, where you're going to help people and you, uh, have people utilize this material. And when I talk to, uh, say, Mitch Daniels, I show them, well, look here. This is our old approach, where down here, these are the promotion and tenure criteria that say, well, look, what did you do? What did the individual do? Right? That's what we evaluate in promotion and tenure. But maybe that's not the, the best way to evaluate a person's career. And really up here is where the surviving universities are going to be where that foster large-scale collaborations. All right. Also, what was missing is incentives. right? Why would I put up my codes? So here's a, a, a friend of mine, Dragica Vasileska. She has some 17 tools on NanoHub. I pulled up the numbers. 56,000 users. So when she writes a proposal to NSF, that's a great way to say, yes, I have an outreach program. My software reaches 56,000 people. I'm not planning on doing that. I'm already doing it. And if I do more, it's going to be even better. But how about the young people that maybe take it along? Here's a shameless advertisement of a book that we wrote together on computational electronics. So Sheikh Ahmed was a postdoc in my group. And uh, he um, published some, what, eight tools or something, uh, 26,000 users up to date. And when he left Purdue, he went to southern Illinois. There was no traffic on nano in southern Illinois. And suddenly, there's a lot of traffic in southern Illinois. Remember the Supreme and the Spice model, where people take it along to the next institution? This is what's happening here. And what's even cooler is he got early tenure after just two years. And a statement from his department had actually said that his involvement with NanoUp creating new curriculum was actually one of the main reasons why he did also get early tenure. So kind of cool. And out of this cornucopia of research comes something new now. 
Our tools are now listed in the web of science and in Google Scholar as a proper publication. That's quite an achievement. Publications used to be PDFs, right, or written papers that you cite. Now these tools are citable as digital objects in Google Scholar and in Web of Science. So I think with all of these tools, we busted the myth that we can be developer friendly, it can be done. And I'm gonna go through some of these other items. Accessibility, I think is, uh, I'm just gonna show the picture and say we are accessible. I don't make much more points. And the next one is on the user friendly side and what are we doing there and what are we enabling? So that's what I wanna show next. And that is the following here. So if you look at NanoUp today in the front page, we are about modeling and simulation. We want to enable people to learn and teach. We want to enable to, uh, people to develop software and then share and publish it. And there's a new landing point for sem semiconductor workforce development. Of course, semiconductors are in everybody's mind right now with shortcomings and with uh, onshoring into the US. So we, we are aiming for really making semiconductor tools available to people. Now, if you look at typical TCAD tools, technology computer-aided design tools, they have certain requirements. The requirements are, it's a fundamental understanding of devices and processes. These are not novice tools. You have to add a, have a basic understanding. They need significant operational training. They need dedicated computational tools and licenses. And they're intended for end users that are designers and developers. Pretty high end in the food chain of, of, of using these tools. Now, the key element is fundamental understanding must be present. So if I teach a course in semiconductors, which I do, I don't have time to teach TCAD tools. I'm teaching concepts, fundamentals, not TCAD skills, and my schedule is actually full. There's nothing I can do in my curriculum to teach these TCAD tools. That means, in general, students do not use modeling and simulation in their training. They literally use textbooks that are 50 years old, more or less, with analytical formulas with fundamental physics. Now, what we've done is we wrap apps around these sophisticated tools to enable us to really uh, deliver these into classrooms. And I'm gonna tell you the story about that. So here's the landing page. Our bread and butter is really our unique capability of uh, delivering modeling and simulation. We have open courseware. Uh, and with new other lectures, Mark Lundstrom has been pushing for a set of new textbooks that are different than the old textbooks from 1960s to 1967. Uh, we have now commercial software. Oh, here are the apps. We have a, there's sort of a mind map of apps we have where you can look at concept and tools. Uh, we have expert tools. We have commercial tools. We have curated resources. We do this with partners. And we have faculty resources where it holds recitations for faculty on how, to, how they can enhance their class, how I'm enhancing my own class. And we have them show up at all kinds of uh, day and night times when we give these recitations. Now, I want to highlight this tool here we call Abacus. And that is what we use for semiconductor teaching. If you teach a course, you typically have band structure in the crystals. Then you might have a device like a PN junction and a MOSFET. And those are the, the materials I teach. And this tool has been used by over 360 classes now, over 17,000 users. And here is an example. This is our modern version of Crystal Viewer. It's uh, actually running in a Jupyter notebook. And people can play with crystals. When I was a student, the faculty member brought this physical ball on stick model, handed it to the person in the first row, and said, please don't break it. And the guys in the back, yeah, too bad. Right now. We actually have a virtual model where people can rotate these crystals into certain crystal directions and actually learn symmetries, et cetera. Here's an example of a PN Junction Lab, also in the newer version. This under the hood actually has a real full-fledged TCAD tool under the hood, like a real tool, not a toy application. And again, you can look at internal physical quantities like charge distributions, et cetera, and students can play with ideas and concepts. Now, there's a, a bit of an issue with our site, if you will. How do we know uh, where these classes are? Because the site is open and free, and the registration information in general is quite of, uh, incomplete, let's call it that. 
people, we, we're not having a locked off site, so how do we know where these classes are and what they do? And we do this really by behavior analytics. So let's imagine you have a user here and she uh, comes and uses on one, the first day she uses the green tool and then doesn't come back the second day. And then the third and the fourth day uses the orange tool, come back, uses the green tool. So you kind of have a sequence of days of what a person does from their first day on the site to say the last day on the site. And underneath I have sort of, sort of scattered data that is how it shows up in our logs. We developed algorithms to classify users and compare them. And here is a group of people that basically comes in a week and uses the yellow tool. Here's a group that uses the orange tool. This is spring break. And there's a group that uses one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different tools throughout a semester. We can measure classroom size and semester length by people behavior, not by surveys, not by bothering people with emails. We can actually measure by behavior, which is kind of cool. And it's really a new approach to, to, uh, to uh, <clears throat> analytics, and it's scalable. And it demonstrates that we can take research codes from re and translate them into education. We do this for many classes, and then we have other people um, that behave completely uncorrelated. So here's a punchline, some 90,000 students in these 3,400 courses or so using this. Now, what I'm arguing also next is that we have other users that come completely uncorrelated, but we can track them by Google Scholar citations. We know what they do on the site. They cited us, so they're bona fide researchers. And we have experimentalists showing up. So that was one of the things we were told we couldn't do. And then we have computational researchers. And then we have a whole group of what we call self-study users. Now, since we're here for computing and RCAC, people always ask me, aren't you running out of compute? So here is an example of each dot here is a user <clears throat> that is uh, running simulations uh, on NanoHub. And we have these individual classes that are highlighted here. These are these colored dots. And they fall into this range of number of simulations or the CPU time. So it goes from a few hundred to maybe a thousand to, say, ten, one hour, 10 hour ballpark. Now, the researchers on a, a bit of a different scale. They run up to 10,000 simulations for hundreds of hours. So, and their distribution is quite wide. And if you compare these, uh, these are really on different distributions. So if I don't show you the individual users, you can see that the researchers really span out further in CPU time. But there's some research also being done here at the lower end. Not everybody in computational science wants to really be running for hours. There's a lot of people that just need ideas, uh, simple guesses, and simple tools, and that drives also their research. Now, so their average run times might be quite longer in, in research versus education, but they still live roughly in the same space. Now, so I showed you that we can use these tools in education, and actually designers and developers are also using it for research. So, these are the punchlines on, on here. And what I want to show next is now that I have these classifications in classrooms, I can also say, well, this purple tool is actually a education tool, right? Or the green tool here. I can develop a scale from zero to one and measure these tools in terms of utility in classrooms, right? And each dot now is a tool. Now, we have these social network charts of citations. We can rank tools also on this vertical axis on research. And each dot, again, is a tool. Now, people think you're either research or education. My peer reviewer said we have 121 uh, tools on NanoHub. This is about, I don't know, 2009, I think. And which one is research? Which one is education? I'm like, I don't know. And you want an answer by tomorrow morning at 8. And I'm not the author of these tools. So, but now we actually have analytics that show, indeed, there's tools that bridge both. And what's even cooler, in this dual use, we can actually track it over time. So if a, if a tool is born here in the origin, I don't know what that tool is going to do. And I can go back 20 years of data ballpark. And we had few tools. We had 500 users. Uh, NCN was created, and then we developed this interactive tool base. And it was much easier to publish tools this way. You didn't have to just talk to a web developer. 
And you can see how many tools come in and how they drift towards education. This is literally translational research in action. This is how translational research can happen and translational work can happen. And it's visualized with real data. How fast can we change curriculum? Each tool has a birthday, it has a digital object identifier, we can measure the time. It takes less than six months for a new tool to be adopted into classrooms. So we can do this really fast. Now, let me switch gears a little bit <clears throat> and go back to, again, usability and uh, how I look at uh, uh, how we should look at science gateways. So we are always out for new innovative capabilities, right? The cool new research. And I want to show you a, a, a cool new device. Uh, it's the first car. And that car is actually was very expensive, right? And it had a driver. And the driver was also probably the mechanic and the gasoline fetcher. And in the back, you had the big fat guy that had a lot of money. Now, what really made a difference for cars is creating cars that are affordable and accessible. And that was Henry Ford's thing. He really made these available to a broad public. You might remember these uh, uh, figures, right? Tablet PCs are cool. And then when the iPads came out, people said, ah, oh, ARM processor, not powerful. These tablet PCs are so much more powerful. Yeah, but you had to read a 200-page manual before it did anything for you in terms of uh, recognition. You had to train it and all kinds of things, right? So it's, again, usability. And you may not know what these acronyms are, what these, these tools are. In my field, they mean a lot. These are community codes. They're hard to use. They're specialty codes. And they are somewhat similar to this car. So here, this car is uh, our new supercomputer that we have at Purdue. Uh, this is the grad student here with an X term at his fingertips. And this is me in the back telling him what to do. This is how we do research today with our new facility. And what NanoHub has done, it has put interfaces on tools that are really hard to use and brought them into people's hands. And one of the tools is very dear to my heart. So here's the interactivity. One of the tools that's uh, dear to my heart is this Nemo tool. And uh, that tool uh, basically is a development over many years. It uh, allows you to look at atomistic structures of real transistors. And I'll walk you through some of the examples here uh, for that. This tool scales to 221,000 cores, perfectly linear. So you run for, on this tool for an hour on this, uh, at the time, Titan machine, or for 25 years on a single CPU. That is how perfect that school, uh, code scales. It's probably still the only engineering code that scales at that level in, of parallelism. All right, so it, it won a Gordon uh, uh, Prize uh, honorable mention. At the time, the Japanese had the bigger computer, so we couldn't get the same performance. And uh, uh, what it also does, it does really cool science, like a single atom transistor work that we studied a couple of years ago. So in the same code base, you can do engineering, you can do science, and really make a difference. And it took 28 years to develop. And what I think is ultimately really cool, and that was one of the reasons why I came back to Purdue, was to make it available to people. There was no way at JPL or at TI I could have made these codes we were developing available. Now I can boast there's 56,000 users of these nine um, uh, tools or apps that are powered by Nemo and NanoHub on impact across the globe, which I think is, to me, pretty cool as a researcher. Now, we, I just inserted these slides. We heard about power requirements uh, in the previous talk and, and how we're um, limited by that. So here is a, a, a chart I had for a while. Moore's law forever is the question. And you, you scale up on a log scale the number of transistors. And the question is, can that continue? But what we've already seen is that the clock speeds are no longer getting faster. We're basically pegged at around 2 gigahertz, maybe 3. And they don't get faster. And that's really related to the power limitation that you can consume. You can consume about 100 watt uh, per, uh, per die. And I want to get into why is that special? What's this 100 watt? And um, 
I, I start this discussion here with a chart from Pete Gelsinger, a person that you might know now. Pat Gelsinger, he's now Intel CEO. This chart is from 2004. Now, this is a kind of tongue-in-cheek chart, but it shows uh, the if we increased our normal performance, we, we are at 100 watt, it's about a hot plate. Uh, um, more than 100 watt per square centimeter, it's the uh, power density of a nuclear reactor. That's how hot this thing is on, on a tiny area. If you go up to a rocket scale, uh, rocket um, nozzle, right, obviously that stuff melts. So it's a, a pure thermal issue of how much power you can run into these systems. And what's also interesting to know is uh, where is this power consumption coming from? So I'm an electrical engineer. I know about these kind of uh, circuits. You may not know much about it, but basically a basic switching unit consists of two transistors that um, switch between high and low. Now, the power in the circuit that is being consumed nominally, and that was the glorious day of, of CMOS devices, is only happening when these things are switching. So the power goes as the frequency, meaning how often do you switch? And then it goes with a charge bucket, the capacitance that you charge up and down. So basically a bucket of charge and the voltage square that you operate it at. Okay? So very simple. And uh, you can reduce the frequency of your computer and make it slower. That would be one way to act on it. Most people don't like the idea. Uh, you can make the devices smaller that reduces the capacity, a uh, capacitance. That we do, but it's very hard. The easy way was to scale the voltage, the voltage at which you operate this transistor. And that went by the square. So very, you would just divide your voltage by two, you get a, a power uh, reduction by four. Dramatic uh, improvement, right? So that is how the industry went for 30 years or so until that stopped. And let me tell you why it stopped. It, there's a second uh, component uh, that is the so-called static power, meaning um, it, the power you consume when you do nothing. It's just you hold the state. And that happens to go as the inverse of this voltage in an exponent. So you reduce that thing, your po static power goes up. And I'm gonna explain to you why that is so here is a pictogram of a transistor. You have a source and a drain. You have a gate in between. And electrons want to go from the source to the drain. No matter what you do in this kind of switch, uh, you will have electrons flow over the top. You can make this barrier as big as you want, but there's an exponential tail of carriers waiting for you to flow. So that means there's electrons flowing even though the transistor is nominally off. That's this point. If you open the gate more, more current turns on. There's a slope here that you cannot evade. That's this famous 60 millivolt per decade slope. But basically, this is the limitation of this transistor. This is how this transistor works. And there's a threshold here. And you can uh, teach the details of why this is, why this carrier distribution happens, and where this comes from. But in this device, you can't get around it. This is the fundamental of this device. And the 60 millivolt is, is, this is the best switch you can do. This slope in general is actually flatter, meaning uh, this switch is not going to be what you, this is what we're stuck with and we have a problem. So if we now reduce this drain voltage, uh, this uh, supply voltage here, with this perfect transistor, all we're going to do is shift this curve to the left, solidly to the left. And what happens? This is on a log scale, right? You your leakage current goes up exponentially in your ideal transistor, and you can't do any better. If you scale this voltage down too far, you're gonna climb up exponentially in your power loss here. And that is exactly what the industry has seen. As you made the gate length smaller and smaller, this way, the static power leakage is now crossed over with the dynamic power. These transistors consume as much power Operating or not operating. All right. So what you really want is you want to bend this over. You want to have, if you think of this as a spaghetti, you want to line it up and have a steeper slope. And there's some ideas for alternative devices. 
uh, where you can uh, introduce a barrier and lose that exponential dependence. But the sad news is these are really, really hard to make. And they haven't found a breakthrough. So here is um, now the, the interesting thing on, on Moore's law. We see how these devices have gotten smaller. And the number of atoms that de determine these devices are getting fewer and fewer. And uh, what's kind of cool is since uh, 2020, uh, so we started interacting with Intel, and they used this NEMO code for uh, uh, designing transistors since 2015. They bought their own supercomputer in-house to run the software uh, to design transistors. And um, now it's being commercialized with Solvaco. So um, uh, here's a quick overview of where this software came from. So we started at TI, then at JPL. And whenever I have a green here, we have new capabilities coming in. And the latest version uh, is our NEMO 5. And really, the key element here is all of these codes are over 200,000 lines or 500,000 lines of codes. These are not simple toys that you're going to just code up in MATLAB, right? So these are industrial strength codes now. And, um, and they're being run on NanoHub. So I think I'm starting to run out of time. So I wanted to highlight that a key element is for us to get uh, students trained in these devices and semiconductors. But just taking the fundamental TCAD codes that are industrial strength or the research codes, is a non-starter. If you really want to teach the, the, uh, the aspects of computing in this world. So this is why we have this uh, site for um, development in workforce and, and deliver these materials directly for semiconductors. And I'll thank you for your attention. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> no. Nope. All clear. As mud. That's good. What's next? What's um, next? For NanoHub, I think uh, we've been very strong in devices, device modeling. That's my historical capability. Uh, when I talk to people uh, that are doing circuits, that have circuit software like Cadence, they tell me there's one person designing a, a flow for a circuit or sub-circuit with a GUI. And they create an input deck. And then they hand that input deck to 10, 15 others that actually run that input deck and optimize all the parameters. Does that sound like an app that you can actually then use for teaching as well, right? Even inside the specialty houses, they have one specialist that takes this complicated GUI and does a layout, and then there's 10, 15 others that are feeding off of that. You can do that with circuits. You can do that with process modeling. You can do that with systems design. You can do that with all kinds of software where not everybody needs to be the umph degree expert that can create a novel, complete new layout. But to teach existing layouts, to teach what the trade-offs are in a given layout, you can do that with apps that are wrapped around these input decks and then visualize what is needed to teach the concepts. So I think that's what's next in terms of education um, and reaching the masses, right? So we can actually excite students to, to come and want to study semiconductors or want to be a, a circuit designer. Uh, we have to fill the pipeline. It's, it's, a, it's a pipeline problem. Right? I mean, supposedly we need about, uh, what, 50,000 new engineers in the next five years? I don't know where they come from uh, unless we start to filling the pipeline. And it has to be easier. It can't be all math. It can't be um, uh, textbooks from the 1960s. It has to be the new stuff. And it has to be real. But it has to be easy. So the new material needs to be created. I think that for, is, is the growth market for NanoHub. All right? Ah. All right. I'll unplug.
plug your. You'll be out of your way in a minute. This one back. Okay, I think it's it on. Should, I think it's on. It's on? All right. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you very much, Gerhardt. I really appreciate that.